welcome to CBMC's English Worship Service. Happy Thanksgiving weekend to you. And whether you're new or you've been with us for many, many years, we are thankful that you are with us today. Let us sing for joy to the Lord because he has done gloriously.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, when your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. what is happening at CBMC, you can go to our app or you can go to cbmcla.org slash digital. Our youth are continuing to receive clothing donations for their outreach clothing thrift store. It's going to be put on by the students and the proceeds are going to go to missions. You can contact Pastor Patrick for more information. 
Starting next week, Children's Ministries will be reopening now preschool and kindergarten. And it's only going to be available at the 1130 service. You will need to RSVP your children every single week. And then lastly, mark your calendars for the English Congregation in-person Christmas party. And that's going to be December 19th. Pastor Patrick will give us the word today while I preach to students. Hello, my name is Pastor Patrick, and it is my privilege to bring the message from God's Word to you this week. This week we're talking about this idea of delusion. Now, nobody wants to live in a state of delusion. Let me illustrate this. So suppose there's a little boy named John, and he goes to first grade, and his parents want him to do well. So bad, in fact, that when he does not so well on his first math test, they, with their power and their influence and their money, convince the, the little John's teacher to give him a great grade and to tell him that he did a fantastic job on math. And they bought into this idea so much that they convinced the entire class to convince John that he, he had done better than everyone else, that he was really excellent at math, that he was a math prodigy. Well, this carried on to second grade, and of course he did even worse on that test, and so they continued on the delusion of convincing the teachers and the students and the other parents to all convince and, and make John believe that he was this math whiz. And they kept the delusion going all throughout elementary school and middle school and high school, and eventually he goes to college and goes to MIT, and they convince MIT to call John a math prodigy and his professors, whenever he would say something that was truly completely wrong and, and, and completely off base, they would convince his professors and the professors would say, well, John, really in all my years of teaching, I have never heard anybody say something so intelligent and wonderful as that. And he wrote papers that were nonsensical but were published in all of these prestigious journals and, and John became a world famous mathematician and he became a professor and everyone around him, including his wife and his children, all made him believe that he was this math genius. When really he was terrible at math and there was nothing that even made sense in anything he wrote. Well, John grew old and he, and he died, he passed away and he became kind of a joke, a laughing stock. But John never knew. John never knew. In his view, his life was meaningful and purposeful and he had a family that loved him and cared about him and he had a career and he was going to pass on his, his math genius to the, to the next generation. And in his mind, he had lived a fruitful and purposeful life. But for everyone else, he was kind of a joke. Now, understanding why we would not want it to live in a delusion is simple by asking, would you want to trade places with John? Would you want to have his life, even though you would never find out and it'd be assured, you'd be assured that you would never find out about the delusion? For most of us, I think we would be appalled by that. We'd say, no, we would rather be told we were terrible at math and do something else with our life than to live in this deluded state. Well, Jesus is going to address the seventh church in Revelation chapter three today. And we're gonna look at Jesus' address of this church and we're gonna see Jesus address them as being in a state of delusion, of being deluded with a sense of control and comfort. And Jesus is going to address them and say, this is actually the reality. And Jesus is going to invite them into reality. So let's look at John, uh, Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14, where John is, is, is taking down Jesus' words to the seventh church, the final church in the book of Revelation is addressed. And it's this letter to the church of Laodicea. And so Jesus is going to begin by saying this, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And so you'll see, and if you've noticed the past couple weeks, Jesus has used various ways to address himself to the different churches. Right To Sardis, he addresses himself one way, to Ephesus another way. And what you may have noticed is that those addresses, the way Jesus introduces himself, become the basis for what Jesus is going to say to that church. And so it's almost like Jesus is setting himself like he's projecting his ethos. So if you remember from your writing classes about this ethos, so it's, it's this projecting of authority or character, right? What makes it, what about you makes it so that you can speak on this subject, whether you've done research on this subject or you've gotten a degree in this subject, or what is it about you, your character or your experience that, you, that makes you qualified to speak on this? And so Jesus is giving his 
qualifications, you might say, in order to address the church of Laodicea in this way. And you'll notice that he focuses in on a little bit of his authority. Right? He says, the words of the Amen. Now, this is very unique in that uh, the, the Amen is never used as, as a proper noun in Scripture except for this one place. So you wonder, what is John or what is Jesus doing in this letter where he calls himself the Amen? And if you think of the word Amen, we say at the end of prayers, right? We say, in Jesus' name, Amen. This little formula that, that is actually very biblical. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we, where we repeat this idea that it is through Jesus that all God's promises find their yes. And that is why through him we utter our amen. And so in other words, we say in Jesus' name, amen, because amen is this kind of let it be so, so be it. This is going to be done. This is accomplished. It is finished. It is already being enacted, right? Like it's, it's on the way to being completed. Amen. It's almost similar to a gavel that the judge will, will nail down. It's kind of being, this is the final, this is the final ruling. This is the final judgment. This is it. And Jesus will speak in the Bible. And if you, if you grew up doing the King James like I did, it's verily, verily, I say unto thee, or, or in the modern translation, it's like, truly, truly, I say to you, right? Where it says like, so this is, this is the truth. This is the completed uh, form of it. I have the authority. And so when Jesus is the amen, he is the gavel, right? He is the final word. He is the, the final authority. And he goes on to build on this point by saying the faithful and true witness, right? I don't change in my judgments. I, I am perfectly truthful when I speak. And finally, to, to kind of complete this, the, 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 great, the greatest of these, he says the beginning of God's creation, the beginning of God's creation. In other words, Jesus is, is repeating what Paul says in Colossians where he says, it is in him and through him and by him and for him, referring to Jesus, that all things were made. That everything was made in and through and for and by Christ. And so you have the Father at the beginning of creation speaking the word of creation and Jesus is depicted as that word. The word was with God. The word was God. In the beginning. And so Jesus is saying, I am the creator of reality. Not only am I the final authority, not only am I the faithful and true witness, but I, in fact, created reality, and reality exists in, through, and for, and by me. And so, especially when we think about delusion or we think about living in a state of reality, Jesus is saying, I am the final authority on reality. And so he kind of sets up this foundation from which he will then address the church. And so let's go into the meat of this letter where Jesus begins to address the church of Laodicea. And we'll notice that unfortunately and very, very sadly, there is no commendation. There is no encouragement. There is no comfort for the church of Laodicea. In fact, there are two churches, Sardis and Laodicea, where Jesus does not begin with an encouraging word. And we take it from this that there is almost this kind of, uh, it's so bad that there is nothing really good to say or encouraging to say. And so the silence or the absence of this encouraging word is very stark and um, visceral as we see all the other churches were given this except for Laodicea and Sardis. And so Jesus begins in verse 15 to address the church and says, I know your works. I know your works. I have seen, I have observed, I have been able to witness what you have done. And he says, you are neither hot, cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is a very harsh and, and raw analogy. And for the church of Laodicea, it would make a, a whole lot of sense considering their geographical location. For the church of Laodicea was situated between Colossae and Heropolis. And it is through Colossae and, and, and the streams that would come from Colossae that they would get very cold water that they could use for a lot of wonderful good purposes. And it was from the hot springs in Heropolis where they would get um, hot water that they could use for, for ointments and salves, especially this eye salve that they were famous in making, which will become important later. And so uh, Laodicea was actually very well situated to use the cold water from Colossae, the hot water from Heropolis. They also were uh, great in textiles and had woolen textiles. They were the, the, one of the more famous exports of wool and clothing. Not only that, but they were the banking center of that section of the world. And so they were very wealthy, very rich. 
And not only that, but they also had great medical advances where they had created this eye salve that was extremely effective. They had made other medical advances to extend lifespan, right? They were, they were a thriving, flourishing, economical, medical, sociological hub. But getting back to this water analogy, they would understand that the cold water from Colossae, if it comes to their, uh, their city and it's lukewarm, it's worthless. It's not worth anything anymore. Or the hot water from Aeropolis, if it comes down from the mountain and it becomes cool, if it, if it stagnates somewhere or pools somewhere and, and, and cools off, it becomes worthless. So worthless, in fact, that you have the image of Jesus Christ, the, our Savior, just spitting them out of his mouth. And they would understand that a part of Jesus' critique is already becoming available to them as they understand that the cold and hot water, the way it becomes lukewarm is through stagnation, through it pooling and sitting, through it becoming complacent. And Jesus goes on to say the reason why they are lukewarm. He says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need Nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So Jesus is directly contradicting their view of reality. They, they say, they look at their money that their banks have brought in and say, we are rich. They look at their wool and textiles and their medical advances and their sociological um, advances and they say, we have prospered. They look at the physical world around them and they say, we have all this money, we have all this clothing, we have all this security and inf uh, income and comfort that we, we don't need anything. And Jesus challenges that. He says, no, in fact, you think you are rich. You think you have prospered, but you are actually wretched, pitiable. You say you can see with your beautiful new eye salve that's so effective, but really you're blind. You say we have these great clothes to clothe ourselves. We have these nice, fine clothing that the whole world is envious of, and yet you are actually naked. Well, this is, this is interesting. How is it that Jesus is speaking this? What is Jesus actually saying and critiquing them? How are they poor? How are they wretched? How are they blind? How are they naked? And so Jesus is speaking to a spiritual reality. See, the people in Laodicea, the church, especially in Laodicea, have fallen into this delusion of control. Delusion of control. See, you ask somebody who has no financial security, or you ask somebody who has no home to live in and has to live out in the elements, the cold, the heat. You ask somebody who doesn't have nice clothes that make people think well of them, where everyone looks down upon them, right? You ask somebody in that situation whether they are in control of their life, whether they are at the mercies of the world or not, and they will say, well, no, I'm not in control. If the sun's too hot, I could get heat stroke. If it's too cold, I could freeze. You, you can see how this delusion of control comes in when you, when you collect yourself wealth and material things where you begin to believe, wait, I have control of my life. And I think COVID, for many of us, may have woken us up to this reality. That although we had made so many medical advances, although we had made so many economic advances, although we had made so many of these sociological, supposedly, advances, this time period of COVID where we saw so many broken down by a virus that we can't even see with the naked eye. That we can recognize again how, how weak, how frail, how helpless of human beings we are. And that yes, we can bring in money to bring some safety and security. We can, we can try to find material possessions and build homes and build structures like the Tower of Babel, right? To try to make ourselves invincible to this world around us. But in the end, we are so weak, frail human beings. You'll notice in this culture, and Pastor Keith actually, um, one of the first couple of weeks, he took me on, on a field trip to a, 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 a cemetery. And we talked about how cemeteries have become so disconnected from churches. How even my, me growing up in the little country, countryside of Delaware, right, our, our cemetery was 
in, in front of our church, right? You had to drive the driveway to our church. You passed the cemetery on your left where my grandmother was buried, where, where a... Um, where, where a cousin was buried, where my friend's sister who died of cancer when she was 15, where she's buried. I used to drive past it every Sunday going to church. And I went to school there as well. So we had to p- drive past it every day going to school. And so there was this, this kind of reality of death around us. But now you, you notice that in, in, in America today, it's often not like that. We push cemeteries off to the corner so we don't have to see them. They're not associated with church. We don't like to think about death or destruction or dying. We don't like to be reminded about how weak and how vulnerable we are, how frail our human body is, how susceptible we are to disease or the weather or cold, how actually we are all terminable. We all have a terminal disease called human existence. And so the church of Laodicea had done this. They had accrued wealth and material possessions where they now say, I am who I project myself to be. I wear nice clothes and so I am honorable. I am good. I am seen as, as great and powerful. I have money. I have possessions. So I am seen as if I am in control of my life. And Jesus is saying, actually, no. In fact, you are poor. You are blind. You are naked. And the sense of naked is very important too as well because when you think about the Garden of Eden, the reason clothes were introduced was to hide shame and guilt. Adam and Eve, when they, when they sinned against God, they, they, it says they, they saw and they knew that they were naked. Right? And this kind of nakedness is this, when you are naked in front of someone, you are vulnerable. You are exposed. That's why often some of the scariest dreams we have of, of standing up in front of people naked. Because right? we feel exposed. We, we are vulnerable to attack, to criticism, to, to mockery. And so Adam and Eve, they felt no longer safe. They felt no longer like they could be vulnerable, that they could, that they could just reveal who they are to people. They had to cover and hide. And this is what clothes do. And so the Church of Laodicea had knit themselves nice clothing so that they could feel like they were, they were honorable and dignified when in reality they were naked. They were exposed. They had shame. They were dealing with shame from their past failures and faults. They were covering, they were trying to cover their insecurities and their fears and their, and their worries. And Jesus says, you think you're deluding yourself into thinking that you can cover your shame with nice clothing or, or your insecurities with nice clothing when in reality you're naked. So Jesus is, is calling them out of this delusion. He says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. He says, you think you're rich with all of this uh, material wealth that you've accrued to yourself when in reality you're poor. You need gold refined by fire. And what is this gold? It's refinement of character. It's taking from Jesus and learning from Jesus the courage, the integrity, the humility, the kindness, the gentleness, the the truth of character we find by fire, right? The painful way, the narrow way, not the, not the broad way that leads to destruction, but the narrow way, the hard way of having a character refined by fire. He says, you can, you can purchase that from me. And that is something that will last, something that is worth something. It's not to decry or say that financial security is wrong or bad. The, the scripture is very clear that it is not money that is the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. So we look at riches. They're not wrong in and of themselves. They're not, it's not wrong to accrue wealth to yourself. But if we accrue wealth believing that that is, that is our security, that is our safety, that is our lasting legacy, that is where we are living in the delusion of thinking that we can control the world, control our lives with money. That money gives us this power and this delusion. And then Jesus says, and also buy white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. See, the gospel deals directly with our shame. The gospel isn't just about this court case where our sins are stacked up and Jesus says, okay, I'll take those sins for myself and God declares us, declares us free. That's a part of it. 
But there's this other great, uh, great piece of it that we often forget about, the shame that comes with sin. Right? The shame that comes with us rebelling against God and being kicked out of the garden like Adam and Eve, being shoved out. Now we're alone. And when you're alone, we feel the shame and we feel the guilt and we feel unlovable and we feel rejected and we feel unworthy to be in a relationship with God. And we feel naked and exposed. And we try to cover our shame by accruing wealth, material possessions, positions, and power. But in reality, we still have that shame that lies deep within us about the past faults we made, about the failures we have, about the mistakes we are currently making, right? We have this shame. And Jesus says, come to me if you are feeling that shame. Come to me and I will give you righteousness, clothes of righteousness. You can find in me the adoption into the family of God, the bringing back into relationship with God, into a community, to the body of Christ where you can experience freedom from your shame. Freedom from your shame. The kind of freedom you can't get with nice clothing and position and power kind of freedom you get by being fully known by God and fully loved by God. The freedom you get when you open up those places of your heart that you don't show anybody else. When you open them up to God and to others and you experience the love of the Father. It's the kind of clothing of righteousness that Jesus is offering. And he says all this in verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be jealous and repent. Jesus is very clear. I don't do this because I'm angry or spiteful or hateful at you. I desire you to know the true wealth of character, the true purpose and meaning of life that goes beyond this material collection of goods. I desire for you to know that you are loved and made whole in the Father's love and not live in your shame, trying to cover your insecurities by position or power or good works that are like filthy rags. God as our Father longs for us to flourish in reality. He doesn't want us to live in the delusion of collecting material possessions as our security. He wants us to live in the reality and truth of the world that we live in. He wants us to experience the fullness of what he created us to be, his children, in relationship with him. That is his desire for you. Out of an abundance of love, he has made a way for you to be redeemed and brought back into relationship with him. To you, for you to experience the true peace and satisfaction and joy of life that could only come through the spirits working in your heart. That's his great desire for you. Out of love of a father. And then he gives this invitation. And this invitation is often used in evangelistic settings where people are sharing the gospel, but it's really meant for believers. It's meant for us as a church. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, this is amazing, right? I will come into him and eat with him. I will have fellowship with him. And he have fellowship with me. See, if, the, if, if our lives are like a house, um, we, often, we often cordon off our house, especially in prayer. Right? In prayer, we'll come to God and we'll, we'll show God our living room. Right? We all cleaned up, everything put away. We'll show God our nice, clean kitchen and our dining room where we invite him to come eat with us. But oftentimes there's places in our lives, there's places in our hearts and our souls where we have stuffed all of our baggage, all of our regret, all of our shame. The places we don't want anyone else to know about. We've shoved them in closets. We've shoved them in the attic or in the basement. And we like to show Jesus all of our awards on our walls or the trophies on our mantle place, all the good things we've done, all of the good Christian things. And that's okay. That's good. He, he rejoices in our obedience and, and, and in our successes. He rejoices with us in those. But imagine opening to God those places of your heart where you experience the deepest shame. Opening to God the places of your heart where you experience the deepest failure. 
and having Jesus enter into those places with you and not get angry, not start throwing things and and trying to clean up real fast, but sitting down with you in those places and being with you and you with him. This is the invitation of the gospel, to come out of hiding, to allow Jesus to come and to be in relationship with him and to allow him access to the deepest core of you where instead of trying to accumulate wealth and riches to cover up that insecurity, you allow Jesus to come into those places and heal you in those places. And Jesus ends this letter with a promise, the way he promises all the others. He says, the one who conquers, the one who endures, the one who, who in this sense opens to me and allows me to come in, who, who gets rid of the delusion, right? who doesn't place their trust in material possessions or wealth or comfort or medical advances, he says, to that person, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I have conquered and sat down with my father in his throne. See, Jesus not only forgave us of our sins, he has walked the path before us, the path of suffering, the path of surrender, the path of servanthood. He has walked the path of giving up material possessions, giving up comfort, giving up um, all of those things for the will of the Father. He has walked the path where he has taken the cross. And he says, just as I have conquered and sit with my Father, you are called to conquer. You are called to follow after me in my power with the Holy Spirit's help by the grace of God to conquer. And you have the promise of eternal life, the promise of the peace and the joy and the satisfaction and the lasting peace, joy, and satisfaction, the true, the real peace, satisfaction, not fake, not Deluded, but real meaning and purpose. And then he declares, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is asking, do you have an ear to listen to me? Do you have the heart open to say, I've heard you speak, Lord, that I have put my trust and possessions in in material wealth and in accruing power and position in my own goodness or in my own sense of self-worth, I have put my trust in my own good actions, my own giving to the church, my own dedication to Sunday mornings instead of in your love and the character that you give through the Holy Spirit, through the white garments that you provided through your death and resurrection, the way out of shame that you provided. And so let's close with that invitation. And if you would even just take some time now to wherever you are, just to sit and close your eyes. And then in in prayer, imagine those places of your heart where the doors are shut, where you are covering and hiding. Maybe it's places of deepest regret, of shame, of embarrassment, Maybe it's places of sin, hidden sin, that you don't want anyone else to know about. Maybe it's places of of brokenness where someone has hurt you in a way that has made you closed off and hard. And now in those places, what would it be to invite Jesus to come? To hear Jesus knocking on the door of those places And saying, I want to come in and be with you in that. I want to come and, and, and dine with you in that. I want to be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful that Jesus, you do not leave us in a delusion. But that, Lord, you remind us that we are weak, that we are fragile, that we need you. And Jesus, not only do you remind us of our need of you, not only do you teach us of our frailness, but you invite us into a relationship where we can find in you true life, find in you true righteousness, find in you true covering for our shame and our guilt, how you will come in and heal those places. So Lord, we pray that you would allow us to open to you, open to your word, open to your spirit coming in where we'd be able to have a relationship with you, even at the deepest parts of us where we experience the most shame and guilt. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. pronounce a blessing to one another out loud. Philippians 4, 19 to 20. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. 
To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us, and we hope you have a blessed rest of your Thanksgiving weekend.